please give a warm welcome. I'm not going to say any more because I want him to. I want you to hear from him as much as possible. This is Dr. Adrian Smith. who's uh, been so kind to me on my return to Greenwood and um, has uh, welcomed me uh, and invited me uh, to speak on uh, the wisdom of Solomon. And I'm delighted that there are so many of you that are interested in the apocryphal literature. <laughs> so let us start out with the title, Wisdom of Solomon. And the first thing to say was, there was a by Solomon. Uh, and how we know this, it was clearly composed in Greek. And remember, Greek didn't become the uh, uh, lingua franca of the uh, uh, ancient Middle East until fourth century after the conquest of Alexander the Great. And Solomon, I like round numbers, he's around 1000 BC, and of course he's writing in Hebrew. So it was what there wasn't written by Solomon. Because of when it was written, we can nip it in on either end. Um, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, sometimes called the Septuagint, uh, was started in Alexandria around 250 BC. And Wisdom of Solomon and its interaction with the Old Testament is clearly uh, citing the, the, the Greek translation. So that means it's after 250 BC. Even more interesting, Wisdom of Solomon is clearly echoed in multiple books of the New Testament, which start to be written about 50 AD. Um, and it, you know, it's much easier to believe that multiple New Testament authors uh, borrowed from Wisdom of Solomon than the Wisdom of Solomon borrowed from multiple New Testament authors. So, sometime in between 250 BC and 50 AD is the date of this Greek composition. It's all that, as we said, not Solomon. It was a diaspora Jew, heavily influenced by uh, Greek rhetoric, Greek language, Greek philosophy, Greek culture, and very likely living in Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian context becomes clear from repeated references to Egypt, rather negative, throughout the book. And that would perfectly fit with, uh, with, with somebody who was in exile in a foreign country, surrounded by foreign and alien uh, religions and philosophies. And this is what is said in Wisdom of Solomon chapter 19, verse 14. Um, it's talking negatively of uh, certain people, and you'll you pick up the reference. Others had refused to receive strangers when they came to them, but they made slaves of guests who were their benefactors. <coughs> they made slaves of guests who were their benefactors. Well, of course, Joseph was a benefactor of uh, Egypt, and after, uh, after the death of Joseph, uh, the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrew race that were their benefactors. So it was because of references to Egypt and the negative tone thereof suggests being written in Egypt. How we can narrow it down to Alexandria? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, huge Jewish population in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, furthermore, Alexandria was a major centre for Greek culture and philosophy. Okay, so it's not written by Solomon, but the persona of Solomon does appear in the middle of the book in a first-person voice. And this is clearly a literary device whose impact is to root the book in the ancient Jewish wisdom tradition that is, of course, so strongly associated with the figure of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the Old Testament. Furthermore, by self-identifying as wisdom literature, the book Wisdom of Solomon 
is clearly interacting with the Greek philosophy that surrounded this Jewish author in Alexandria, because as most of you will know, philosophia, the Greek word, literally means love of wisdom. I said the wisdom of Solomon is echoed in the New Testament. That's putting it mildly. Wisdom of Solomon was hugely influential on the writers of the New Testament. And the wisdom of Solomon was extremely highly regarded in the ancient church. Um, I'm assuming Brad, Brad covered this last week, but uh, it's, it, wisdom of Solomon is in the, the Greek Old Testament alongside the books translated from Hebrew. And therefore it ended up in the Eastern Orthodox Church canon of the Old Testament and the Roman Catholic canon of the Old Testament. So our Greek Orthodox, now Roman Catholic brothers, regard wisdom of Solomon as inspired, authoritative, sacred scripture. What's even more interesting for me is that in the second century AD, uh, frag uh, there's a, a, a frag uh, uh, there's a fragment written in the second century AD. It's called the Muratorian fragment, and it's a, a second century AD list of books to be used in public worship in the New Testament church. So it's a it's a it's an early and incomplete canon list for the New Testament. I think, it, I think it, it implies the four Gospels, Acts, Letters of Paul, and uh, First Peter, and First John, uh, but not, any, but not the, the, the later books of the New Testament. So it's an early and incomplete canonical list of sacred authoritative books for the New Testament church. And it includes, believe it or not, the wisdom of Solomon as a, an authoritative New Testament book to be used in the worship of the new public reading of Scripture in the New Testament church. So with, with that, with that backstory, I really want to focus on this beautiful document, Wisdom of Solomon, its influence on the New Testament and its value for us today. Its influence on the New Testament and its value for us today. And I'd like to begin by reading a paragraph from the end of Romans chapter 1. A couple of <coughs> paragraphs. I'll make a couple of comments on them and then I'll read from Wisdom of Solomon. So this is Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, <coughs> verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honour him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And then Paul adds, since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what would not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. 
And Paul's argument there is really twofold. It's that nature have to know your lectern. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's a slip ability. Um, okay. Uh, let's, um, let's try to recover this. My bad. So, look, so a double argument. The first is that nature reveals itself as divine handiwork. Nature reveals God because nature is God's handiwork. Second point is that Paul makes is that idolatry, worshipping the creature, the something that God made instead of the maker, idolatry is the root of all kinds of vice. Idolatry is the root of all kinds of vice. Now, I can't resist an aside at this point, and it's only an aside, that's why I want to get back to this for so long. But you know how in uh, the, the history of uh, church in America, uh, there have been, been various uh, social reform movements uh, attached to the church. I and mean, we go back to, for instance, 1920s, 1930, you have the, the era of prohibition. Now, of course, drunkenness, alcoholism, is vicious. It is destructive. Uh, but when we simply attempt to legislate against vice, in the way of Romans 1, we're not actually getting at the root of the problem. We're simply dealing with the surface symptoms. According to Paul, the root of vice is loss of the knowledge of God, and God substitutes what the Jews call idols. In other words, if we are to combat vice, the ultimate weapon is not legislation. The ultimate weapon is the spread of truth, particularly restoring the knowledge of the true God, the Creator. Back to Wisdom of Solomon. Um, I invite you to, with those words of Paul in mind, I invite you to listen to Wisdom of Solomon, which of course was written before Paul wrote. Wisdom chapter 13. For all men who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know him who exists. Nor did they recognize the craftsman while paying heed to his works. But they supposed that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent waters or the luminaries of heaven were the gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things <coughs> men assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord, for the author of beauty created them. And if men were amazed at their power of working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is he who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of creating things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Wisdom, Solomon, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. I think it's very clear that Paul is, as it were, cutting and pasting not merely the logic of that argument, but some of the very wording. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, this is every bit as beautiful, maybe more so, uh, than what Paul himself wrote. And then, you get to chapter 14, uh, verse 22, Wisdom and Solomon, and you see the same argument that idolatry leads to vice. Wisdom and Solomon 14. Afterward, it was not enough for them to err about the knowledge of God, but they lived in great strife due to ignorance, whether they kill children in their initiations or 
celebrate secret mysteries or hold frenzy revels at strange customs. They no longer keep their lives or their marriages pure, but they treacherously kill one another or grieve one another by adultery. And all is raging riot of blood and murder, theft and deceit, corruption, faithlessness, tumour, perjury, confusion over what is good, forgetfulness of favours, pollution of souls, perversion, disorder in marriage, adultery and debauchery. And then concludes, for the worship of idols, not to be named, the worship of idols is the beginning and cause and end of every evil. That is exactly Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1. And he got it from wisdom of Solomon. This idea of uh, nature implying that God is the craftsman who made all the beauty that we see around us. God is the, the craftsman, the artificer of nature. This uh, intersects the biggest idea of wisdom of Solomon, and it is the idea that I want to major on the rest of my presentation. And the, the, the big idea of wisdom of Solomon is the personification, even the divination, of wisdom. Wisdom, as it were, with a capital W, is regarded by, wisdom, by, by the author of that book as a, a person and a quasi-divine person. Now, this, of course, roots in the Proverbs of Solomon, this personification of wisdom and the close association of wisdom with God. And you, you could probably infer that the reason that our author chooses to virtually equate wisdom and God is that he's operating in a context dominated by Greek philosophy, which was a search for wisdom. Um, let me read you from Proverbs chapter 8. And this depicts wisdom as a craftsman working alongside God in um, the artificing of the, the, the cosmos. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27. When he, that is God, established the heavens, I, that is wisdom, was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he had marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, this is wisdom speaking, I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. You see the uh, close connection there between God, the creator, and wisdom personified. And this uh, vocabulary is, is echoed in the, the book we're studying today, Wisdom of Solomon, in uh, chapter 7. And I'll start reading, I'll, I'll read verse 22. Uh, because it, it, it connects to what I just read from Proverbs. They'll go back and, and read, read some more. <laughs> the, the author, uh, the, uh, our author writes that wisdom, the fashioner of all things, and the Greek word is technita, it's like technician, craftsman, Wisdom, the fashion, the craftsman, the technician of all things, taught me. And this is what God uh, taught him. What wisdom taught him. Verse 15, May God grant that I speak with judgment and have thoughts worthy of what I have received. For he is the guide even of wisdom and the corrector of the wise. For both we and our words are in his hand. As are all understanding and skill in crafts, 
For it is he who gave me unerring knowledge of what exists, to know the structure of the world, the activity of the elements, the beginning and end and middle of times, the alternation of solstices and the changes of seasons, the cycles of the year and the constellation of the stars, the nature of animals and the tempers of wild beasts, the varieties of plants and the virtues of roots. I learn both what is secret and what is manifest. For wisdom, wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. So he starts off by saying that God, the creator, taught me. But he ends up by saying that wisdom, the, the fashioner, the craftsman of all things, taught me. See, the, the personification and the close identification of wisdom personified with Creator God. Now, Proverbs also personifies wisdom under a female image, and this female language, pronouns she, her, yeah, picked up on in uh, Wisdom of Solomon. But let me go back to uh, Proverbs um, chapter 9, where wisdom is personified as a female hostess setting forth a life giving feast. And she has a female counterpart, Lady Wisdom's counterpart is Dame Folly, who has a sort of a, a parallel universe of a tempting feast, but it's a, a poisonous feast. And listen to this, uh, Proverbs chapter 9, and uh, the, the female personification of wisdom. Proverbs 9. Wisdom has built her house, she has hewn her seven pillars, slaughtered her beasts, mixed her wine, and set her table. She sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Whoever lacks sense, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. And her counterpart, Dame Folly, is like this. Proverbs 9 again. The woman Folly is loud. She's seductive, but knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And uh, here with that said, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there and her guests are in the depths of the grave. This, uh, this, uh, this philosophy of life has ultimately two parts that you can choose the way of wisdom or the way of foolishness, the way of life or the way of destructiveness. This is echoed in, in the Wisdom of Solomon, but it's particularly the personification of wisdom um, in the feminine form that I want to pick up on. Uh, because Wisdom of Solomon picks up on this personification, accenting the, the beauty of wisdom. Uh, listen to this description in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, of wisdom's beauty. And treasure. Um, Wisdom, uh, Solomon chapter 7, verse 7. Therefore I prayed, and understanding was given me. I called upon God, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepters and thrones, and I accounted wealth as nothing in comparison with her. Neither did I liken her to any priceless gem, because all gold is but a little sand in her sight and silver will be accounted as clay before her. I loved her more than health and beauty. I chose to have her rather than light, because her radiance never ceases. Verse 28 to 29. God, God loves nothing so much as the man who lives with wisdom, for she is more beautiful than the sun, and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior. Can uh, consolidate 
from what hope you've been hearing and discerning through these quotations. Um, if you put Proverbs Solomon and Wisdom of Solomon together, you get a multifaceted personification of wisdom. Wisdom is the craftsman behind nature, the artificer, the technician of nature. Wisdom is the hostess of a life-giving feast. And wisdom is the supreme treasure, the most valuable, the most beautiful that anyone can attain. And uh, Proverbs chapter 3 uh, introduces this wisdom as treasure in the tree. Uh, let me quote you from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver. Her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. So wisdom personified as she, more precious than gold, silver, or any beautiful gemstone. And that, of course, is picked up and accented from Proverbs into the wisdom of Solomon. You know, if you stop and think about it, what's been spoken on here is what uh, the, uh, in the terms of uh, ancient philosophy, in terms of the Latin idiom, is the summum bonum, the supreme good, uh, the, the greatest value, the highest treasure. And Proverbs says that that supreme good, that highest treasure, is wisdom. Well, if you think about it, logically, wouldn't the highest treasure be none other than God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the source of all life, and the eternal, the imperishable, the incorruptible God? And whilst Proverbs points in that direction, it, it opens the door to equating wisdom and God. It doesn't go through the door. The wisdom of Solomon boldly steps through that door. Um, wisdom of Solomon radically extrapolates the personification of wisdom and in Proverbs into a virtual divination of wisdom. Let me give you a, a couple of examples of this. Uh, wisdom is equated with the Spirit of God in uh, our author from the Apocrypha. Wisdom of Solomon 9, 17 says this, Who has learned thy counsel unless thou hast given wisdom and sent thy Holy Spirit from on high. The gift of wisdom there is paralleled with the sending of God's Holy Spirit from on high. See that the two, wisdom and Holy Spirit, are God are virtually equated. You also see that at the beginning of the book, in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, talking about the pervasiveness of wisdom, throughout the cosmos and even at the depths of the human soul. But, but then shifting language to speak about the pervasiveness of the Spirit of God. Have a listen to this in the sense of connection, wisdom, Spirit of God. For wisdom is a kindly spirit that will not free a blasphemer from the guilt of his words, because God is witness of his inmost feelings, a true observer of his heart and a hearer of his tongue. Because the Spirit of the Lord has filled the world, and that which holds all things together knows what is said. Then you have the Spirit of God, or wisdom, pervading the cosmos and holding all things together. Chapter 10 of Wisdom of Solomon is the strongest and boldest uh, equation of wisdom with Yahweh, God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel. Basically, Wisdom Solomon chapter 10 retells the patriarchal narratives and the uh, 
and uh, the Exodus narrative. It retells uh, Genesis and Exodus. But for but where Genesis and Exodus in the Hebrew Bible, the Greek translation, have have a Yahweh or the Lord um, doing all the actions. Wisdom of Solomon has wisdom doing these same actions. I want you to listen to uh, Wisdom chapter 10, verse 13, and see if you can imagine which Old Testament patriarch is being alluded to here. When a righteous man was sold, wisdom did not desert him, but delivered him from sin. She, wisdom, descended with him into the dungeon, and when he was in prison, she did not leave him until she bought him the scepter of a kingdom and authority over his masters. Can you all hear who's been spoken of there? Joseph, exactly. Um, and in Genesis, in Hebrew and Greek translation, says that, that Yahweh was with Joseph in prison. What does that all the say? It's wisdom. She was with Joseph in prison. Um, the, the Exodus itself is attributed to uh, wisdom in, in uh, Wisdom Solomon chapter 10. And the theophany of Yahweh, who appeared as a pillar of cloud and fire, is equated with wisdom. Have a listen to this. A holy people and a blameless race. Wisdom delivered from a nation of oppressors. She entered the soul of the servant of the Lord, Moses, and withstood dread kings with wonders and signs. That wonders and signs, that's the vocabulary of Exodus for the place. She gave to holy men the reward of their labours. She guided them along a marvellous way and became a shelter to them by day, the pillar of cloud, and a starry flame through the night the pillar of fire. She brought them over the Red Sea and led them through the deep waters, but she drowned their enemies. So the Exodus itself, attributed to the right hand of Yahweh in um, uh, Genesis and Exodus, is here attributed to wisdom herself. See what's going on here? There's this bold, not only personification of wisdom, but a virtual equation of wisdom with God. Now, it's, it's the punchline of all of this. <laughs> Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7 uses language about divine wisdom personified that in, in the Greek, remember, it's really Greek as it's New Testament, in the Greek is taken up verbatim in several books of the New Testament. I'd like to listen to this very beautiful description of wisdom in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 24 to 26. Wisdom is more mobile than in emotion, because of her pureness she pervades and penetrates all things. For she is a breath of the power of God, and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, and therefore nothing defiled has its entrance into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image, or icon in the Greek, of his goodness. Read that again, it's, it's, it's so beautiful, because it gets at the heart of personification and divination of wisdom in our author uh, and see because it's it's echoed in the New Testament. For wisdom is more mobile than any emotion, because of her pureness she pervades and penetrates all things. She is a breath of the power of God, a pure <coughs> emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image or icon of his goodness. This vocabulary is taken up in the New Testament to depict Jesus himself. Let me uh, turn to the prologue of the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, 
Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in his last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And that's what's said about wisdom in the wisdom of Solomon and prophets. He, the Son of God, is the radiance or the Greek word is actually reflection. It's the same Greek word used in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7. <coughs> that he is the radiance or reflection of the glory of God. That's the idiom of Wisdom of Solomon about wisdom. He is the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And that's echoing what we've seen in Wisdom of Solomon, of wisdom pervading and holding together the universe. Colossians chapter 1, um, equally beautiful, it speaks of uh, Jesus as the image or icon of God. And that is what is said of wisdom in w Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, Christ, is the icon or the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So then you have the vocabulary of Jesus as image of God, which is said of wisdom in Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7. You have this uh, idea of wisdom, or in Colossians, Jesus pervading the cosmos and holding it together. Colossians also uses that treasure idiom to speak about uh, Jesus, the treasure idiom for wisdom that is found in uh, Proverbs and Wisdom of Solomon. Um, let me go back to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 8. Verse 4 and 5. She, wisdom, is an initiate in the knowledge of God. The Greek word is mustis, from where we get our word mysticism. She's an initiate in the knowledge of God and an associate in his works. If riches are a desirable possession in life, what is richer than wisdom? And that same combination of knowledge of God and treasure is, a, is ascribed to Jesus in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Where the author Paul speaks of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So according to Colossians, Jesus is the key to knowing God, just as in Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is the key to knowing God. This is why the Wisdom of Solomon was so highly regarded in the ancient church. And some of the ancient church fathers regarded it as fit for being read in public worship along with the Gospels. And the epistles. Because when the ancient church read the wisdom of Solomon, they realized that in Christ they found all the excellence of divine wisdom that is spoken of in this ancient Jewish Greek 